from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the African and Middle East uh, Division. I'm Mary Jane Deep, Chief of the Division and I'm happy to see you all at this uh, very exciting program with Professor Namwal Serpel. This is the first program of 2016 in the ongoing library series entitled Conversations with African Poets and Writers. In October 2011, the Africa Society of the, Af uh, the African, the Africa Section, sorry, the Africa Section of the African and Middle Eastern Division, in partnership with the Poetry and Literature Center, headed by Rob Casper, and the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa, then headed by Bernadette Paolo, launched a new program at the Library of Congress, consisting of conversations, interviews, with established and emerging poets, short story writers, novelists, and playwrights of continental and diasporic Africa. Four years later, the series has become well-known and well-established, and has brought to the library and to our patrons and readers, as well as to all those who access the library's webcasts around the world, some of the best writers from Africa. From those who are no longer with us, like Chinoa Achebe and Ali Mazrui, the Albert Schweitzer Professor of Humanities at Binghamton Universities, to poets, to poets laureate, like Kera Petsi Kego Sitsil, the poet laureate of South Africa, to the new generation of writers, like Amadou Kon from the Côte d'Ivoire, Nigerian writer Igoni Barret, the poet o Omekongo Dibanga from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Tijan Salah, a Gambian poet. We bring them to you, to our patrons, and to everyone around the world. And we want to let you know that there's a great literary tradition that has existed for quite a while, but that is blooming in full force now um, in the United States, in Europe, on the continent, in Africa, and in many other places as well. And today we're delighted to welcome to our series Namwali Serpel, the 2015 Kane Prize winner for African fiction in English, a bright star in the firmament of African writers. But before we start the program, I would like to introduce the new president of our partner organization, the, Afri the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa. Patricia Bain, who will address you in a moment. Patricia Bain was named president of the Africa Society in January 2016, so officially just two months ago. Prior to assuming this role, she worked for 10 years at the Africa Society. She served as the director of programs where she supervised a staff of six and conducted educational programs and activities throughout the United States and on the ground in Africa that reached thousands of students, educators, and administrators. In this capacity, she also worked with many domestic and international partners in devising strategies to heighten awareness and provide information to millions of individuals worldwide. Ms. Bain also worked as program officer for the organization where she successfully mobilized over 5,000 individuals to participate in programs spanning many sectors and areas. A native of Uganda, Patricia's knowledge of international issues, in particular the continent of Africa, resulted in her being selected as a research fellow for the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa for the late Congressman Donald Payne, who served as chair. In this capacity, she conducted research, wrote speeches, drafted memoranda, helped organize hearings, and interacted with, public, with the public at all levels in representing the interests of the chairman. Patricia Bain worked at the Embassy of Uganda uh, in two intervals in the Office of Consular Affairs and as a special assistant to the ambassador. She graduated from the University of Virginia in May 2001 with a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations. Patricia Bain. Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Deep. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Today, I'm thrilled to say that I'm also here with our CEO and Chairman of the Board, Ambassador Pamela Bridgewater. Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Together, we represent the new leadership at the Africa Society, and we are very um, honored and pleased to continue this series with the Library of Congress, with the Africa section, um, the section of the African and Middle Eastern Division and the Poetry and Literature Center of the Library of Congress. Because the Africa Society's mission is to educate Americans about Africa, the cultures, the countries, economies, and the contributions that emanate from the different countries of the continent of Africa. And we tell a different story from what you generally see in the media. African literature and poetry is vital to communicating a contemporary and evolving image of Africa. And so we look forward to hearing from a vital creative voice in uh, Professor Namwali Serpel the first Zambian to win the Kane Prize winner for African writing, and one who shared her prize money with the other four sh shortlisted writers, which I thought was very amazing. <laughs> we appreciate your participation here today, and we also welcome those who will be seeing this webcast in the future. Enjoy the conversation and get some questions ready. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Rob Casper, the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress. Uh, we're thrilled to be working with Patricia in her new role. Uh, big congratulations to her. Uh, she's been uh, part of the Africa Society, as you heard from Mary Jane, for 10 years and now gets to uh, help us shape this series and do, continue to do amazing work at that organization. Uh, I also want to thank again Mary Jane and the African and Middle East Division, uh, as well as the Kane Prize for African Writing and the Lannan Center for Poetry and Poetics at Georgetown University, which hosts the Kane Prize Residency. This is the first time the, poet, the Library of Congress uh, is officially partnering with the Kane Prize and the Lannan Center, and we couldn't be happier about doing so. Uh, so let me take this opportunity to ask you to turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices you have that might interfere with this event. Uh, second, I want to tell you that this program is being recorded for webcast, and by participating, you give us permission for future use of that recording. Uh, before I get into today's program and explain it a little bit, uh, let me tell you about the Poetry and Literature Center. We are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, and we put on 40 such programs uh, throughout the year, both here at the library, uh, within the district, and around the country. To find out more about this series uh, and other literary programs at the Library of Congress, you can visit our website, www.loc.gov poetry. You can also find out more about uh, the African and Middle Eastern Division uh, and view webcasts in our Conversations with African Poets and Writers series on their website, www.loc.gov slash rr slash Ahmed. We are delighted to feature Namali Serpel today to read from her Kane Prize winning story, The Sack. Ms. Serpel will also participate in a moderated discussion with Ahmed Area Specialist Laverne Page. And we'll leave time after their moderated discussions uh, for uh, questions from the audience. So we have two mics, we'll bring a mic around so we can record your question. Uh, Namali Serpel's first published story, Mazungu, was selected for the Best American Short Stories 2009 and shortlisted for the 2010 Kane Prize for African Writing. Um, she got it the second go around. Uh, she received a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writer's Award in 2011, and in 2014 she was selected as one of the most promising African writers for the Africa 39 Anthology, a project of the Hay Festival. Her writing has appeared in Tin House, The Believer, N Plus One, Callaloo, The Guardian, and elsewhere. Sir Pell is currently working on a book of essays, Facebooks, and a novel, The Old Drift. She is an associate professor of English at the University of California at Berkeley, and her first book of literary criticism, Seven Modes of Uncertainty, was published in 2014. And now, please join me in welcoming the 2015 Kane Prize winner, Namali Serpel. Hello. 
Thank you to everyone for coming, and thank you so much to the organizers. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of The Sack, which is the short story that won the Kane Prize, and then I'm going to read from a different story um, that uh, just came out, is I think just launching uh, this month. There's a sack. A sack? A sack. Hmm, a sack. Big? Yes, gray, like old Quacha. Marks on the outside, no shadows. That's how I know it is moving. Something is moving inside it? The whole sack is moving, down a dirt road with a ditch on the side, with grass and yellow flowers. There are trees above. Is it dark? Yes, but light is coming. It is morning. There's some small birds talking, moving. The sack is dragging on the ground. There's a man pulling it behind him. Who is this man? I can't see his face. He is tallish. His shirt has stains on the back, no socks, businessman shoes. His hands are wet. Does he see you? I don't know. I'm tired now. Close the curtains. Yes, Buana. Jay left the bedroom and went to the kitchen. The wooden door was open, but the metal security gate was closed. The sky looked bruised. The insects would be coming soon. They had already begun their electric clicking in the garden. He thought of the man in the bedroom, hating him in that tender way he had cultivated over the years. Jay washed the plates from lunch. He swept. A chicken outside made a popping sound. Jay sucked his teeth and went to see what was wrong. The Isabi boy was standing outside the security gate. The boy held the bucket handle with both hands, the insides of his elbows splayed taut. His legs were streaked white and gray. How do you expect me to know you are here if you're quiet? Jay asked as he opened the gate. The boy shrugged, a smile dancing upwards and then receding into the settled indifference of his face. Jay told the boy to take off his patapatas and reach for the bucket. Groaning with its weight, Jay heaved the unwieldy thing into the sink. He could just make out the shape of the bream flush against the inside of the bucket, its fin protruding. Jay felt the water shift as the fish turned uneasily. A big one today, eh? Jay turned and smiled. The boy still stood by the door, his hands clasped in front of him. His legs were reflected in the parquet floor, making him seem taller. Do you want something to eat? The boy assented with a diagonal nod. You should eat the fish you catch. It is the only way to survive, Jay said. I told him about the first dream, but I did not tell him about the second. In the second dream, I am inside the sack. The cloth of it is pressing right down on my eyes. I turn one way, then the other. All I can see is gray cloth. There's no pain, but I can feel the ground against my bones. I am curled up. I hear the sound of the sack, sweeping like a slow broom. I've been paying him long enough, paying down his debt, that he should treat me like a real buona. He does his duties, yes, but he lacks deference. His politics would not admit this, but I have known this man since we were children. I know what the color of my skin means to someone of our generation. His eyes have changed. I think he is going to kill me. I think that is what these dreams are telling me. Nyla, I cannot remember your hands. Thank you. I'm gonna read, I'm just gonna read a little bit from this, um, this is a new story. Um, so when I won the Kane Prize, the writer Tracy Chevalier, um, infamous for writing a Girl with the Pearl Earring, um, wrote to me having read an interview I'd given with The Economist in London. They'd asked me, who, uh, what literary character do you most identify with? So I listed a bunch of them because I, I tend to be multi-voiced and um, identify with many people. Uh, one of the characters I said um, was Jane Eyre, who I said was my spiritual uh, twin. So she wrote to me and she said, oh, you must write for this collection of stories inspired by Jane Eyre called Reader, I Married Him. Um, and it's all female writers, um, British and American, Canadian. Um, there's a woman from uh, Istanbul. Um, and 
um, I wrote a story about a wedding. Uh, I'll just read the beginning of it. Um, it's called Double Men. A friendship that fails to negotiate dogs and chickens is doomed to wither, even a friendship that has weathered decades of hardship and tedium. Mamalota and Nangela had raised their children together, performed birth and death rites in tandem, carried loads light and heavy as one. Now that there were no men left in their households, they depended on each other, hooked their every days, the tasks of tending to body and home. In a small field, they grew enough greens, beans, potatoes, cassava, yams, groundnuts, and maize to feed themselves, and kept the surplus in Mamalota's storehouse. They gave the damaged but edible leftovers to widows even less fortunate than they. Mamalota bought the dogs because the storehouse had been robbed again. This time she'd caught them in the act. She'd burst through the door with furious shouts, her chitenge haphazard, her barely there hair uncovered, light spoken erratically from the lantern she held aloft. The boys fled, crawling from her hailstorm, except for one boy who, Mamalota speculated later to Nangela, must have been raised by a bitter woman who beat him too hard and too often. His lackeys scurried pitiably around him, but this boy alone stood, lengthening up like a thread of smoke, his fist wrapped around a stone Mamalota had thrown. He spat and threw it back. It struck her above her left eye, knocked her over, knocked her out, and turned her eyebrow into a red smear that healed later into a purple cross, which everyone said made sense, since her husband, long deceased, had been a pastor. Those thieving boys had broken in through the one small window in the storehouse across from the locked entrance. When Mama Lota toppled across the threshold, they ran away through the door she'd burst through, ran right over her body, their pockets and hands full of all they planned to sell. And just for the sake of it, they stole the lantern that had tumbled from her hand. This was why Mamalota had sent her nephew to purchase the Doberman pinches. Not because of the stolen food, nor the requited stone, nor even the wound it had opened. It was this pettiness of taking her lamp, which her husband had received as a boy from a Muzungu hunter he'd fetched game for, and which he had polished every night of their marriage, whistling pleasantly through the gap in his front teeth. Mamalota liked to remember him this way. Nearby, his mouth and hands occupied, and now the glass and metal thing that reminded her of a lost person, it too was gone. They can't even use it, Mamalota complained in her high soft voice as she poured Nangela a cup of tea a few days later. Where will they find the paraffin? Hey, those boys, Nangela replied in her trembly baritone, glancing at the bandage over her friend's eye. They were in Mamalota's kitchen, sitting on a pair of rickety chairs inherited from the church when Pastor Chisongo died. The women watched the steam untangle above their teacups, shaking their heads at the old familiar nightmare, able-bodied males with nothing to lose. A ferocious noise scraped through the window, a snarling, snatching sound. Nangela started. The dogs were quarreling. Ah, but is it good to have these double men around? She shuddered. They're like demons. The Doberman breed is good for protection. I picked the angriest ones, Mamalota smiled, then frowned. I'm not going to suffer for some stupid child who throws stones at his elders and just takes. She sucked her teeth. I don't know, Nangela shook her head. I think they're eating our chickens. The Dobermans were indeed rapacious. They had rather sensibly begun to supplement the leftovers Mamalota gave them with mice and birds and snakes, and yes, the occasional chicken from the coop behind the storehouse. The fonder they became of her, the more lit broken little corpses would the two young dogs lay at Mama Lota's feet. She'd pick the carrion gifts off her steps with a grimace and scold the grinning beasts. Foolish monkeys, she'd frown and then smile, patting them on their warm, flat, black foreheads as they wagged the knots where their tails had been. But they were not foolish. That was a sentimental view to take about such vicious creatures. Nangela discovered how vicious the very next morning. Okay, I would like to, my name is Laverne Page, and I'm in the African and Middle Eastern Division. Um, I would like to introduce you again to our speaker and tell you a few personal things about her, such as the fact that she's originally from Lusaka, Zambia, in Southern Africa, where her family still lives, 
and her father is a professor of psychology at the University of Zambia. And we have several of his works here at the Library of Congress in our collections. Her mother is an economist and has worked uh, for a while with UNDP, the United Nations Development uh, Program. Uh, Professor Serpel moved to Baltimore when she was nine, and she was educated here in the US. Uh, she received her BA from Yale and her PhD from Harvard. And she's lived in California since 2008, where she's associate professor of English at the University of California at Berkeley, which you've been told. Um, her research work is in contemporary fiction and film. Uh, her work concerns the relationship between aesthetic exception, uh, reception, affect, and ethics. She is, and we've been told also that she's currently working on a book of essays and, and a novel. I'm very interested in the Baltimore part <laughs> of her story. She grew up there, she started writing quite early. And so I'm just wondering when exactly you first started writing and why you turned to fiction. Uh, thank you so much um, for the question. Um, so my family moved to Baltimore in 1989 and it's from around then, and uh, there's a little red notebook that my parents found recently and sent to me. And it has my name very carefully written on the inside. And it has um, ideas for stories. Some of them I think I thought were gonna be actual novels, but they, <laughs> they have yet to <laughs> be written. <laughs> um, but they had titles like um, Gymnastics and Horses Don't Rhyme which <laughs> was a story about a girl who had uh, a mother and a stepmother, and each of them likes the other sport. So the mother liked horses, and the stepmother likes gymnastics, and the little girl tries to figure out how to please them both, and eventually does an acrobatic routine on a horse. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that was because I had, I had not encountered divorce until I came to America. I knew about divorce because my, my father was divorced, um, but the idea that you had these two families that you would go back and forth, that was new to me. There was a story about um, a murder mystery where the witness said they'd seen something from the side of the road and the police officer says, no, that's not possible because on this, in this country we drive on the other side of the road because it was a British witness, right? So, <laughs> so again, these, there were all of these uh, moments where I was trying to understand my new context. Mm -hmm. um, so in some way, I feel like immigration itself was the inspiration for me to start writing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's lots of other... Um, uh, funny little stories. One was called Weird Science about reading other people's minds. You know, I think you get to that point where you're, um, you know, just about to become an adolescent and you realize that there are other people. Um, so in that transitional stage is when I really started writing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm again still interested in Baltimore yeah, and your, yeah. Your, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your, your early life here. Did you read your stories in, in school, in your schoolroom? Uh, did you share them with no, other well, children? My mom was really excited. There was a story that I started writing about the invention of the alphabet. That was a school assignment. You had to write a, a story. And it was, and it, I had a bunch of people sitting in a room and someone said, ah, and that's how A, and then a B flew by. And you know, <laughs> kind of the cart before the horse there, I think a little bit. <laughs> but. Um, so she was very excited about mm -hmm. that. And so that's definitely a story that I read in school. But um, I was very interested in maths and English. Mm -hmm. So the hard sciences and the very, very uh, human humanities. Um, so my, my parents are both social scientists, mm -hmm. psychology and, um, and economics. Mm -hmm. But I always gravitated to the, the edges. Mm -hmm. And I actually ended up going to a math and science mm -hmm. magnet program in high school. Um, some of you may know this school actually because it featured very prominently on an NPR radio show called Serial. So there's a school called uh, Woodlawn High School um, where, yes, yeah, so some of you are nodding. So I went to that school. I was in that magnet program and 
um, I, I didn't quite overlap with the main uh, figures in that, uh, in that radio show. But, um, so I started off at Yale doing biochemistry because I was interested in the sciences and then switched to English pretty rapidly. Um, but <laughs> much to my mother's dismay. Um, but in um, we, gr I grew up in the suburbs of Baltimore, so we didn't live in the in the inner city. Um, we lived in a prominently Jewish neighborhood, actually. So we were the only brown people in the in the hood. And um, but the school I went to was the magnet school, which we would drive to every day, was predominantly brown, right? Mm -hmm. So um, brown and black and. The magnet program inside the school was mostly white, and then there was me inside the magnet program. So mm -hmm. it was like I was a chocolate chip in the whipped cream. In the <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was a very and you know the 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 racial politics of Baltimore were were very striking um, for my family. I'm mixed race. My father's British uh, white. Um, uh, he's British of origin. He's a Zambian citizen and has lived there most of his life. And my mother is Zambian. And in Zambia, um, some of you may know this, in African countries, there's a category for mixed race people. Sometimes it's called colored, sometimes it's called mixed. Um, and I grew up in Lusaka in a very international context. We lived by the university. I had friends who were Indian, I had friends who were Zambian, I had friends who were white. I had, it was just a very diverse community. And I was born into this family that for, in which race was kind of taken for granted as something uh, inconsequential when it came to how you were treated. Um, and when we came to the States, there was immediately an imperative to choose. You had mm -hmm. to choose. Mm -hmm. um, are you black or are you white? And why do you talk that way? And that sort of thing, right? So there's a lot of pressure to fit into the binary logic um, mm -hmm. in the States. And, you know, it's so nice to have a president who is African, as we like to say, <laughs> <laughs> and is also American, you know, because it gives, it's, it's like, oh, okay, this is recognizable now. This experience is now something people talk about. Um, Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie mm -hmm. is one of my um, most, the recent novels from Africa that I quite like. Um, and I really wished it had been around mm -hmm. when we moved. I, that, that kind of story about an African moving to America, No Violet Bulawayo's mm -hmm. We Need New Names is another version of that, where it's an immigration story. Um, mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well let's flip to the other coast. Um, you're an associate professor um, of English in the English department at, at Berkeley. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how African literature fits into that department. Oh, that's, a, that's okay. an interesting question. So I was hired, ironically, as an Americanist, because I'm not even a US citizen. Um, but most of the novels in my dissertation happened to be by Americans. And the ones that were not got promptly cut, <laughs> um, because when I went on the academic job market, all of the good jobs, all of the jobs worth pursuing were Americanist jobs. So Berkeley is very open-minded. So as soon as I got there, they said, you can teach whatever you want, and it's fine. And most of what I've taught has been um, post-2000 mm -hmm. fiction. I've taught a lot of contemporary fiction. And I've only just um, started teaching African literature, and I taught it in the context of a class on black science fiction which was a diasporic class, so we looked at texts from the States, texts from the Caribbean, texts from Africa. And um, so in, in the context of, of my own teaching, I've mostly taught mm -hmm. British and American fiction, um, mm -hmm. because that was what I was hired to do, but I've recently been branching out into African fiction. Okay, did, did you say though black science fiction? I did, I said black okay. science fiction. <laughs> yeah, I think this is the 10th anniversary, uh, uh, let's see, Octavia Butler died about 10 years ago. Is that right? right? I didn't know, I know yes. they're making a, um, they're finally yeah. making a, a, a TV show out of her uh, Parable of the Sower okay. series, mm -hmm. which is, you know, has been around and is an amazing mm -hmm. work. I, I taught um, um, several of her short stories in that class. Okay. Yeah, I like her a lot. Okay. Okay, thank you. Let's see, I have so many questions here in so little time. Um, okay, if you could tell us about your current projects. Um, 
your book of essays and novel, and um, I'm curious also about the style of writing that mm -hmm. you've described, where you write in bursts. Mm -hmm. And so with a novel, <laughs> that's a big burst, or, yeah. or how, how, do you, how do you do this? And um, so I'm just wondering how this affects your, your writing of longer pieces. Sure. Uh, so the book of essays that I'm working on is the second work of scholarship that um, I'm expected to write for my job at Berkeley. My first book was called Seven Modes of Uncertainty, and it's about um, the reading experience of encountering texts like Toni Morrison's Beloved, or like uh, Lolita, or by, N by Nabokov, or um, The Crying of Lot 49 by Thomas Pynchon, which are these novels that confront you with um, kind of deep puzzlement as to what happened um, or why it happened, and at the same time crosses that uncertainty of knowledge with an ethical problem. So in Beloved, obviously slavery and infanticide, mm -hmm. um, in Lolita, pedophilia, right? So you're confronted with not knowing exactly where you stand, um, and you're given this really um, kind of intractable ethical problem. And I was interested in whether this is actually useful for us, um, mm -hmm. reading these kinds of texts, in thinking about how to be <laughs> as a person mm -hmm. in, t in terms of ethics. So I don't believe that reading books makes us better people, but I do think that books can serve as functionally as ethical philosophy. They mm -hmm. can teach you how to think about how to be a good person. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my first book. My second book takes up a particular issue in ethical philosophy, which is the face-to-face -face encounter, which is uh, you know, a, an idea about how to interact with humans that is very old from you know, ancient philosophy, it's in the Bible, and um, has been taken up by a Jewish philosopher most recently, um, Emmanuel Levinas. And what I'm interested in is, well, what happens when you look at kind of weird faces, the animal face, mm -hmm. um, the mixed race face, the, the passing face, is mm -hmm. it white or black? Um, uh, I look at faces that have been um, damaged and then repaired. So it's, it's a series of chapters about faces. Mm -hmm. um, and the most recent chapter that I wrote um, is about emojis because um, I'm interested in a language made of faces. Okay. <laughs> so I just gave a talk about that. Um, the novel is called The Old Drift, and it's the great Zambian novel you didn't know you were waiting for. Um, and I've published parts of that novel over the years. Um, so while I was getting my PhD and while I was getting tenure at Berkeley, I was also writing fiction. And so I've published, I think, three no, four pieces of this novel as, as short stories. So the sack is in fact the last chapter of this novel. Mm -hmm. um, so this is how I work in bursts, <laughs> in that I don't okay. go in order, right? So I can go kind of across a text. Um, mm -hmm. And I've had, you know, um, had this novel in my head since I was 21 or so. I've been kind of developing it over time and um, working on other stories as well and working on other novels, but um, because the sack is part of the novel, the momentum from winning the prize allowed us to, me and my, my agent, to, to sell the novel. So it's going to come out in 2018 with um, Hogarth Press, um, which I'm very, very pleased about. So I'm mm -hmm. hard at work on it right now. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, the Zambian novel. I understand <laughs> that you travel uh, annually to yeah. Zambia. So could you tell us something about the literary scene in Zambia? Um, do you feel connected there? Would you consider teaching there? Mm. And how does this compare to your connection with, with um, uh, American writers? That's okay. a good question. Um, so my parents moved back in 2002. And since then, I go back every year, um, for a while every other year, because I was broke. Um, now I go back much more frequently. Last year I was there four times. I'm going back on Thursday. Um, <laughs> so actually, because the Kane Prize workshop this year, so ev every year after the prize, um, the year after the prize is given, the four, uh, the five um, shortlisted writers um, go to a country in Africa, and you have a ten-day workshop with local um, students and with writers from around the continent. 
And so last time when I was nominated, we went to Cameroon, and this time we're going to Zambia, which is wonderful for me. Um, so I've, be I've had a lot of contact with the, um, the Pen Club, um, the Pen, Pen Society, I can't remember exactly how they go by, but um, in Lusaka, um, which is made up of young writers and um, they meet every other week at the Alliance Française and they talk about their work in progress. Mm -hmm. And I recently became aware of a new uh, outfit, the Lusaka Book Club, which is just wonderful. Um, so they organized an event for me in September, a reading for me at home, and it was just wonderful. And it's just people in the community who are interested in reading. Um, so we had a breakfast and they asked me all sorts of questions about my story. Um, so, and then there's the University of Zambia. So my dad has been involved there for a long time. He's been teaching in the department there. He was vice chancellor there for a minute. So um, I've, I have some contact with the literature department there. But I'll be very frank with you, when it comes to teaching there, I considered it when I was a graduate student. When I was home for one summer, I spent a lot of time at the, at the literature department. And I felt that I couldn't thrive there because, it, because of kind of inbuilt sexism. And that's a problem in English departments across the world. Um, but there it felt particularly pervasive to me. Um, and so I just felt like that wasn't an option for me. But to teach there in terms of teaching a workshop, I, I, I did a workshop at the American International School. I've done a little workshop with some primary school kids when I was home last. That kind of teaching I might do, but at the university level, I'm not quite sure. Hmm. Okay. Um, afterwards, I'll ask you more about the book club. And, yeah, sure. And that's that's very interesting to me. I'm wondering about uh, African writers, your favorites, mm -hmm. um, and um, you seem to to read all over the place. <laughs> I do. Yes. And so and so also your favorite American writers. Yeah. So um, I'll give you an old writer that I love and a new writer that I love. So. Um, when I was quite young, I was introduced to the work of Bessie Head, um, who is, I think, Botswanan-born, but lived in South Africa, then went back to Botswana. Um, she wrote a book called Maru, yes. um, that, and that was very, very um, powerful for me um, mm -hmm. as a young woman. And um, most recently, uh, Benyavanga Wainana, who won the Kane Prize um, early on, and used his prize money to start Kwani, uh, which is a Kenyan publishing house, but also magazine. Mm -hmm. um, his mm, kind of semi-fictional, least beautifully written memoir, mm -hmm. One Day I Will Write About This Place, is one of my favorite um, mm -hmm. new, new texts coming out of Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, as for American novelists, Toni Morrison and Vladimir Nabokov, who I mentioned earlier, are kind of my my auntie and uncle, I think of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> uncle Vlad, I talk about <laughs> Auntie Tony. Um, and I, what I admire about both of them is they seem to both have been born with a completely uh, self-sufficient sense of their worth as mm -hmm. writers and as people, just completely confident. Um, and it's, it's rare. And it's quite beautiful. Um, some people, I think, perceive it as arrogance, but I think it comes with such a healthy dose of humor in both of them. Mm -hmm. um, people don't often comment on how funny Toni Morrison's novels are, but they are quite funny. Even Beloved has, has jokes. <laughs> Please point them out. I will, I will. There's an amazing scene at the end of Beloved between Stamp Paid and Paul D, and they're laughing about mm -hmm. how about Setha, <laughs> and they're like, you can't leave her alone with anybody. It's really funny. So there's, I think, you know, to have that kind of self-possession mm -hmm. combined with a sense of humor is, mm -hmm. is something to aspire to for me. Okay. Well, um, with time constraints, I should probably ask this last question, which, which we always ask. What do you think is the future for African writers, both from the diaspora and from the continent? What steps need to be taken to bring more recognition from the international community? Um, I think a lot of young African writers are aspiring to move beyond 
a kind of binary thinking, which is that you either write from within the continent about African things, which are recognizable uh, to the West, um, or you write this kind of immigrant narrative that's on the other side, right? And so there's, you know, and never the, never the twain shall meet, right? There's a kind of um, idea of authenticity mm -hmm. and of literariness that don't always coincide in the ways that we want them to. So I think being allowed to talk about our work without becoming cultural commentators or sociologists mm -hmm. of where we're from mm -hmm. um, is a big, I think, uh, push among young African writers. Um, and I think, on the other hand, um, being allowed to write about whatever we want is also really important. That kind of freedom um, to express an African sensibility without necessarily African tropes like child poverty or HIV AIDS or whatever it may be mm -hmm. is a freedom I think um, all of us aspire to. So, you know, for this workshop that's coming up, I've been having conversations with some of the other shortlisted writers about, well, what are we supposed to write? Because it's going to be the Kane Prize, in the Kane Prize anthology. Does it have to be a story set in Africa? Because I've written stories set in the States. I have n ideas for novels that are set in the States that don't necessarily involve African characters. Sometimes they involve African-American characters, mm -hmm. sometimes white characters. Um, and so my friend, she says she's going to write a, an African fairy tale, um, and maybe an African Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and I'm thinking about writing something more um, experimental and more kind of oriented toward an international perspective. So a series of interactions between characters that are mostly over the internet. Um, so I think that, that that's the future, I think, is mm -hmm. the, just the freedom to write about whatever you want and to have mm -hmm. Africanness be part of what you do, but not, not necessarily constrained by, oops. I think it's died. <laughs> Not necessarily constrained by what people think African means. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. okay. We we have a lot to look forward to. That's that's all I can say <laughs> with your writing. Okay. And and as for um, the we, we anticipated having the anthology here, but but we don't. Uh, however, you can read the SAC. It can be downloaded yeah. um, the from Kane, the Kane Prize website. From the Kane Prize website, so you still have access to that. And um, I think now, uh, if you have questions, how much time do we have? About fifteen minutes in. Okay, so um, questions. I was interested in your stating that immigration had been a theme and an inspiration for you mm -hmm. in your writing. In the context of a lot of discussions that we're being in the U.S. seeing today on immigration, do you think that that might be a future uh, topic um, for some inspired writing on your part? Thank you. Um, that's a that's an interesting question. So what's what's funny about me saying that immigration was the spark is that. Um, I actually don't have any immigration stories, technically, it, unless you count time travel <laughs> um, as, an, as an immigration. Um, I have a story in which someone who is raised in the West in the future time travels back and geographically travels back to Africa. Um, but obviously that's much more speculative than um, addressing contemporary issues of immigration. So I've not yet written my Americana or my We Need New Names. Um, and I'm not sure that I will. I kind of, I, I very much enjoy kind of having Africanness appear in my American fiction um, in an indirect way, almost in a stylistic way, and vice versa. Um, that said, um, my novel, The Old Drift, involves immigration, but it involves um, telling the story of how people came from the West to Zambia. 
So The Old Drift is the title of it, and it's named for an early colonial settlement near what became known as Victoria Falls. We call it uh, Mosiotunya, which means the smoke that thunders. So before, um, no, so just maybe 20 years after David Livingston discovered Victoria Falls, um, the British came over um, from what was then southern Rhodesia and came, came up and they went across the Zambezi and they went across on what's called a drift. So it's a calm place in the water that you can drift things across and they made a settlement called the Old Drift. They all succumbed to what they called black fever, which is actually malaria. And so there's a little graveyard there called the Old Drift Cemetery. And so I was, I'm interested in those kinds of m migrations or immigrations into Zambia. So I have people coming from India, people coming from England, and people coming from Italy. And to, as a way of kind of understanding the international kind of context in which I grew up in the 70s, right, or in the 80s. Um, so I'm interested in immigration to Africa, which is a kind of reversal. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, of the, of the normal way of thinking about it. But in terms of immigration to America, that's still un, uncharted territory for me. I just, now that we, those of us who downloaded the SAC and read it, now that we know that it's the last chapter, <laughs> the second written book for it. No. But actually, I, I went, is the whole book comprised of chapters that have been published separately as short stories? Or was it designed to, or is each chapter, does it stand alone? Like, yeah. So it's not a, it's not a um, collection of um, like interlinked stories, the way that, you know, it's not, a, it's not a collection of short stories. So when I, when I first, my first published story was Muzungu, which I wrote in the context of writing this novel. It was a chapter of the novel. I sent it to Kalalu with another chapter and they chose this one. And it was part of an, a, of a an issue that was called New Writing from Africa. They then nominated it for the Kane Prize for short stories. And so then it got turned into, <laughs> it got labeled a short story and then it was in the Best American Short Stories. And in fact, when I first received the email saying I was in this collection, um, I said, well, my story is neither American nor a short story, so. <laughs> and, and, so, and they wrote back, they're like, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> so that's happened a couple of other times. At the SAC as well, I sent to um, the Africa 39 anthology, unlabeled. And they wrote to me and they said, is this a story, should we write a story or should we say it's forthcoming from a novel? And I said, you know, I don't know what the title of the novel is going to be, so just, just publish it as the SAC. And then it was again nominated as a story. So I have actually written short stories. Um, <laughs> it's not just that I keep writing this generic line, but um, I've written a short story called The Book of Faces, which is a take on Facebook and The Book of Job. That's, um, that's a self-contained short story. Um, and I've written um, a short story called Bottoms Up, um, which is a sci-fi story as well. So I do write short stories, but um, the, these just happen to be self-contained chapters of the novel. <laughs> Thanks for coming. It's amazing. I actually actually grew up near Yale. Oh and yeah. And I'm wondering what um, what are your experiences mm. at Yale and how do they compare to your experience at Berkeley? Because they're such a different. Yeah, they're very very different. Um, so I I went to I, my parents encouraged me to go to to an Ivy League school. I was very much under the impression that it was just for rich people. And I went there um, to visit and I really enjoyed it. And I thought this is just an amazing opportunity um, for which I only just completed paying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, paying off my student loans. Um, and you know, it's a very, it, was, it was wonderful. It was very different from Baltimore. I didn't really understand the socioeconomic politics at Yale. I didn't know that people were actually rich until you know I, I graduated and I you know I discovered that my roommates' pearls were real. I thought they had to be fake, you know that sort of thing. Um, 
And, you know, but the, the AFM Center was a big part of, you know, my kind of acculturation into learning about what it is to be black and an Ivy Leaguer. Um, and I started a poetry circle there, or it's like a, it's like a, a poetry performance monthly extravaganza. I called it Black Coffee. I was very influenced by Love Jones. I don't know if any of you know that movie. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to start. And I, I said on the poster, um, black oriented, but not black limited or something like that. So it was open, but it was, you know, Afrocentric in spirit. Um, and we had a we had a, a really fun time. You know, we had sometimes we had students from Harvard come visit for um, the weekend and we gave performances and I sang. I, I wasn't much of a poet back then, but I liked to sing. So um, I like, I lived in New Haven for a summer and um, I liked it a lot. I really love that city. Um, I think the racial politics at Berkeley are quite different. Um, because of the overturning of a proposition, I think a few years before I got there, we no longer can use race as a determining factor in who we admit. And our population of black students has accordingly dropped like a lot. So it's something like 2%. So it's a very different campus from what I experienced even at Yale, you know. Um, and so the diversity on campus is much more comprised of Asian American students and Latin, Latino, Latina, Chicana, Chicana. Um, students. So I've learned a lot about those cultures um, and in teaching my classes that's been a very interesting aspect is seeing these kind of um, forms of cultural solidarity across the student population. What? Okay, one more question. You know, I, when I was a teenager, I used to go to Fells Point a lot, and there was a pizza place there, I don't know if it's still there, that had a pineapple pizza that me and my mom used to eat. So I know it's not very Baltimore, but that's, that's just the, the truth of my memory. Um, we haven't been back in a long time. Um, my sister passed away there, and that, I think, marked that space as a space of mourning um, for m my family. Um, so we, we've drifted around the DC area since then, and um, I have a lot of love for DC and for, and for Baltimore, um, but it's sometimes it's, like a, it's more of a sad space. I think a lot about the Nina Simone song, um, mm. or the, her, I think it's just her rendition of a song about Baltimore, and she says, Baltimore ain't it hard just to live. And there's something about that space that still, for me, kind of rings that bell in my heart. Um, and um, I have a, a novel that um, I finished, but that who knows what's going to happen to it, which is set in the States and is a noir. Um, and so it has elements of crime fiction. And I think that would be, it ends with like a, it has all these really um, dramatic explosive moments like a bomb going off in an airport and the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge collapsing and stuff like that so that would be fun to film. Um, <laughs> the Old Drift has um, is about three generations of, um, of three families and the grandmothers all have these kind of mythical elements to them so one of them is born covered with hair and one of them is covered with eyes and one of them cries all the time and I always think they would be really wonderful to make into a graphic novel um, because they're so um, kind of weird. <laughs> and it would be really fun to draw. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for that. Thanks, Laverne. Thanks, Namali. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, look for uh, Namali Serpel's books uh, to come. <laughs> and please come back to our events, both our conversation with African Poets and Writers and events here in the African Literature Division reading room. Thanks so much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. 
visit us at loc.gov.